What does it mean to act loyally? Many legal relationships carry a duty of loyalty. A corporate board of directors must be loyal to their shareholders, trustees must be loyal to the trust beneficiaries, and lawyers must be loyal to their clients. Often loyalty means acting in either the best interest or the sole interest of the other party. But what do these standards of best interest and sole interest mean? How does law conceptualize loyalty? Richard Brooks is a professor of law at NYU who is here to answer these questions. Welcome to ETH, Rick. It's great to have you here. Before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, thank you. I am an economist and a lawyer. I, was, uh, I studied law at Chicago and economics at UC Berkeley. And my, uh, my research focuses significantly uh, applying game theory uh, to law and also empirical analyses of law. Today we're talking about your paper, Loyalty and What Law Demands. What brought you to the topics in this paper? Yeah, it's really fascinating. I've been thinking for some time uh, about how agents, uh, both from an economic perspective as well as a legal perspective, engage in transactions on behalf of themselves and others. And thinking about loyalty, uh, it's really fascinating, particularly from the common law uh, uh, perspective. In the US, there is uh, the common law of equity, as well as the common law, law of courts, identify two distinct regimes of agents. Uh, uh, agency law uh, characterizes a duty of loyalty, but also equity and trust law characterizes a duty of loyalty. And these things actually mean slightly different things in uh, both in the equitable courts and in the legal courts. And they've evolved over time from this common law notion to now what we have broadly uh, defined are as statutory du fiduciary duties. So what are the three types of loyalty that the paper distinguishes? I think it's really important to identify and to, uh, to describe the ways in which economists have been thinking for many centuries and nuanced ways about loyalty. Because one thing that you sometimes see in the law and economics literature and certainly in the, in the legal literature is a suggestion that loyalty in economics would, top, would direct the law to this one unique uh, position where in fact uh, there is more ambiguity and nuance from economics and it could suggest lots of different possibilities that law might achieve. So economists uh, uh, really have three notions of loyalty, I argue, in the paper. Uh, they, will, they won't necessarily take these terms and they haven't necessarily been articulated in these ways, but if you go through the literature you'll identify that economists either imagine that people act loyal in ways that are considered loyal when they face correct incentives. So if the incentives are leading individuals into doing things that, are, that, that seem to be disloyal, you really can't blame those agents. You really have to look at the incentive structure that they're facing. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, this is exactly how Adam Smith characterized the agents uh, of, the, of the English companies that were settling in the U.S. and, and other foreign locations well, in East India as well, in East India Company as well. A second notion of loyalty uh, that I think has been most explicitly described uh, by George Akerlof in his piece Loyalty Filters uh, uh, un understands loyalty not in terms of the prices and sanctions and incentives that individuals face, uh, but in terms of a, their almost their character or their preferences or tastes, that some people just have a taste to act loyalty. Um, and in this sense, it's, it may be that those tastes are given, but they can also be constructed. Uh, George Akerlof talks about how we uh, sometimes going through very difficult situations together can make people loyal to one another. He calls these loyalty filters. And then in the third mechanism, loyalty is neither about the incentives that, loyal behavior, I should say, is not necessarily determined by the incentives you face or your underlying preferences to act loyally. It's something that is, uh, the way a, a March Sen would characterize it, it's something that's more fundamentally about commitment. You are committed to something or to someone or to certain rules independent of your preferences uh, or uh, and independent of the incentives. This one, I think, is the, the hardest one to capture and to characterize. 
Your paper describes the loyalty game. What is that game? Well, the loyalty game actually is a quite familiar game. It's really the trust game that everyone knows. Imagine a party called the principal, possessing assets which may double in value if placed under the management of a second party called the agent. Assume the agent acts either in the sole interest of the principal, that is, she acts loyally, or acts in, the, in her own self-interest, that is, disloyally. When the agent acts loyally, the principal gets the entire return on invested assets, while disloyalty lowers the principal's return by some amount, called X, which is appropriated by the agent. This interaction is depicted in the game tree, where the principal's initial asset value is 2, which could double to 4 under the agent's management. There's something interesting about describing it as the loyalty game versus seeing it as the trust game. Structurally, the payoff uh, setting is exactly the same as the, the, uh, the trust game. But when we characterize it as the trust game, we're imagining whether or not the principal, the first mover in the game tree, uh, will trust or should trust the agent. And when we characterize it as the loyalty game, we're looking at it from the perspective of the agent. So that is an important difference, and that's really what I want to capture with the loyalty game. And the loyalty game is really showing that agents really, uh, uh, they're placed in the situation, and then this agent is going to be playing an equilibrium strategy, uh, equilibrium strategy, get the, the agent's best equilibrium strategies against the, the, uh, the principles uh, uh, in this particular game. Now, we can use the Nash equilibrium solution concept to identify, which is usually what we identify, and we'll see uh, as the unique outcome, or to identify the outcome of this loyalty game uh, or trust game. And it's, it'll be the same as you would reach if you were just doing the trust game. Um, but there's also another, there are other equilibrium solution concepts as well. John Romer is developing what he calls the Kantian uh, equilibrium solution concept, and quite separate from that is the Bergian equilibrium concept. And if Nash requires that an agent pursues a best response, given what all other agents are doing, uh, the Berge equilibrium also has a best response strategy, but instead of doing the best that you can for, given for yourself, given what everyone else is doing, you, and yourself the, broadly defined, so your utility or payoff function under Nash certainly can include others, it can have other regarding perspectives. Uh, but what the Burge equilibrium strategy is doing is saying that you want to maximize the payoff of the other player, uh, uh, and, and everyone is also playing that strategy, and when everyone is doing the best they can, whatever the, the impetus is, whether it's to maximize your own potentially uh, 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 other regarding utility or the other player's utility, when we have an equilibrium in this particular way, we, we get these, uh, we, we get a, we, we define either the Nash or the Burge equilibrium. So now we have these two possibilities. Uh, it, actually, it's even more complicated than that because much of the models, both in terms of Nash equilibrium concepts, Burge equilibrium, Kantian concept, presumes that everyone is playing the same equilibrium strategy. Or, uh, but it could be that some people are behaving in a Nash way and some people are behaving in a Burge way. It might even be that in some moments it's okay to behave as a Nash agent, maximize it, playing a strategy that will give you the best outcome given what everyone else is doing. And in other instances, it's best to play a Burge strategy. It might be that parents play Burge against their children who are playing Nash against their parents. It's much more interesting and much more complicated, these behavioral norms. And identifying and not fixing, identifying the multiplicity of equilibrium strategies and equilibrium behavior actually might be more representative of the actual world. That's a really interesting game. So how does fiduciary law help solve the problem? Well, if you look at the loyalty game, if the from the principal's perspective, or let's take it, let's call it a trust game. Now, if we're looking at it from the principal's perspective, if the principal is playing against someone she believes to be rat, she believes to be a Nash agent, then her best uh, strategy is to not invest, is to not trust, because if the Nash best equilibrium strategy is to take advantage of the situation um, and the, and and uh, and to appropriate as much of the principal's. Uh, uh, payoff as possible, so it's best for the principal just to hold on to her investments in the first place. If, however, the principal believes she's dealing with a Burge agent, then it's best to invest. 
Now, so uh, how does the principal identify whether she's playing someone whom we may call an Agent Nash versus another party that we may call an Agent Burge? That's something that the law can actually help uh, individuals, both the principals uh, in particular, identify. There may even be a more important question, though, uh, more fundamentally. It's that it's a matter of the question of for the agent. Often we don't know what's most appropriate in any given context. We find ourselves in new situations all the time. And in this situation, in this context, law may help us tell, may inform what is appropriate in this environment. Is it okay for me to act in, in my own interest, so long as it's in the best interest? Is it okay for me to act in my own interest exclusively? Or is it actually not appropriate for me to act in my own interest in this way? Must I only consider the best interest of the other party? For instance, one agent is a, a, a commonly appointed by court is a guardian ad litem. Uh, this is a guardian appointed by the court to take care of children. Uh, in that situation, the, the, the law might actually say, in this moment, as a fiduciary, you can only act in the sole interest. You cannot, even if it's in the best interest of the child, just the very sense that there may be a conflict of interest is impermissible. So if law may actually tell us, not that we are, being Agent Nash or being Agent Burge, it's not a character of people. It's just a type of strategy. People are much more complicated and their characters are much more nuanced. And law may just tell us what strategies are important. And that's what fiduciary law may actually be doing in this context. There's no unique relation between what economics would predict and what would be an optimal uh, uh, stru legal structure for loyalty. Depending on the particular economic notion that you begin with of loyalty, structural, self-serving, or characterological, let's say, or uh, allegiant loyalty, you get different predictions and recommendations for what, would, what economics would prioritize as the best legal outcome. Legal scholars sometimes assume that an economics approach favors the best interests rule over the sole interest rule. But you think this is a mistake. Why? Significantly because there is no unique economic approach. Uh, one of the really uh, compelling things about looking at the economic literature is that you realize how nuanced, uh, the, how nuanced the economic thinking around loyalty has been. Uh, some economists recognize, I think most economists recognize, that how we think about loyalty itself, uh, uh, loyalty is not transferable or contractable. Uh, you can't contract for loyalty. What you might be able to contract for or provide incentives for is for behavior that's observationally loyal by characterizing, by finding the right incentive structure. Thanks so much, Rick, for being here. And if you all enjoyed the video and want to learn more about line economics, click the button to subscribe.